Hey, Blake Rudis here with Everyday HDR and HDRinsider.com, and today I want to show you how to take an underexposed photo, whether it's your fault or not, <laughs> all right, this was my fault, uh, and make it actually look good so you're not throwing these images away. And I know that because I put this on 500px after I was done, just to see what the population would think, and it scored a 96 in under 24 hours, which is actually pretty cool, pretty good for me, all right? So here is our overall before. The foreground looks like it's about four stops underexposed. The background looks like it could be one to two stops overexposed. Very difficult situation to deal with. And I was just about to throw this image away when I brought it into camera raw and worked some magic. All one photo, all happening right now. Let's jump in and I'll show you how to do this. Okay, so we're here in Adobe Camera Raw, and this is where we're going to use our uh, underexposure to make this photo just kind of pop, right? Now, I'm using Adobe Camera Raw because it's my personal preference. Now, you might like Lightroom, and that's totally fine with you, but for my workflow purposes, it's Adobe Camera Raw into Photoshop, and that's how I've operated since the beginning of time for me, okay? So, just to preface that, though, they are essentially the same uh, engine with a different car built on top so let's let's talk about that real quick so i drive a scion xd all right now the scion xd is the exact same uh, engine as the toyota yaris they just take a different shell and put it on top of it adobe camera raw and lightroom are almost the exact same thing they run the same engine there's just a different shell over top of it to make them look different okay with that being said let's talk about this photograph so we are on a workshop in uh, cannon beach this is a cola state park off in the distance you can see tillamook lighthouse really teeny tiny back there so i'm at this scene very difficult to deal with lots of dynamic range from where i am in the foreground all the way to the near distant background uh, so with that dynamic range i had a very difficult time getting the right amount of exposures for hdr i shot a series of zero plus two and minus two it didn't cut it and when I got back to the computer, I realized that those were horrible exposures for this, and I have no dynamic range to make an HDR image, all right, the typical tone mapped HDR image. But I looked at my long exposure shot that I did, the 50 second long exposure shot that I did with the VU filter 10 stop ND filter on. And this is what I had. It's something I can work with. Now you might look at this and say, oh gosh, it's so underexposed, it's trash. Well, a raw file has 14 bits of information in it that are just waiting for you to exploit and beat the crap out of and interrogate until you get all the information that you want out of them, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna interrogate this photograph until we get as much of that uh, image out as we possibly can. And you're gonna be surprised by what we come up with in the end. So the first thing we want to do is get our exposure right. Now this looks to me as if it's about um, two stops overexposed for the background and maybe three to four stops underexposed for the foreground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come right over here to the exposure slider here and move this over um, just to about there, that looks good. I'm not doing too much with the exposure itself because most of what's gonna happen with the sky is gonna come out with the highlights. So I'll drop those highlights down pretty low about that negative 85 range, somewhere around there, and then bring these shadows up to about plus 82. So now you see the whole image is kind of coming forward. And this is the typical tone mapping technique that people would do in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. Jack those highlights down, increase those shadows up, and bing, bang, boom, you've got a fixed photo, right? Well, that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot more that needs to go on because when we drop those highlights down and bring those shadows up, what we're doing is we're really kind of expanding out that dynamic range so far that we lose the contrast between those or the, the, the lightness and darkness between those individual highlight and shadow areas because we're expanding that information so far. So what we need to do is just go into the contrast here and increase our contrast just a slight bit. I'm not going to take it too far. Just just enough to resurrect that information and bring it back. And now I'll take a look at my whites, maybe move those over because I do like how it's a little bit brighter back there. And then look at those blacks to maybe make the foreground a little bit uh, brighter and more opened up. 
And the idea behind what you're doing here, um, don't look at these adjustments and say, okay, well, Blake said that if I've got a negative uh, exposure that's really underexposed, that I can do this and it'll fix it. These exact settings may not work for your photo, but they can be used so that uh, you can get a baseline starting point. So now before I go into the color correction, really making this photo pop, I'm going to go ahead and do two things. I'm going to get some of the boring stuff out of the way. I'm going to uh, straighten my horizon. So uh, you can see that even on a tripod with a bubble level on it, I can never level my head. So I'm going to straighten that out and then boom, that's good to go there. I just got the straighten tool, found that horizon line and straightened it out. And then I'm going to go down here and I'm going to get rid of these, uh, these uh, pieces of fray that are right in the middle of my exposure. You see, they're like right there where this V comes down. And I don't want that to be the lasting impression on someone that that is what I wanted them to see. So I'm going to go into my spot removal tool and I'm just going to kind of casually go through here and grab this spot and see what it grabs for me. And that looks like it's about right, but maybe I'll drag this down and bring it to about right here. So it kind of continues on that line and get some more of that texture from this area. And I'm going to do the same thing with this guy here. Just kind of grab that, move that. And then it's going to try and pull from up here, but that's not a very natural uh, pull. So I'm going to pull from something pretty close to it so that it gets a more natural curve in that uh, line work there. And that looks good. So I'll go back. So I got those preliminary boring things out of the way. And now I'm going to just fit this on screen and we're good to go to move on. Another area of technical... Uh, stuff that really just bothers me are chromatic aberrations. So I'm going to zoom in right back here to this rock because this rock is going to tell me where most of my chromatic aberrations exist. I'm going to need to just zoom out a little bit. So let me go to 300%, maybe 200%. And let's just take it to 100% because I want to see both sides of this rock. Okay. So it looks like there was a little bit of movement in my uh, camera because it was a 50 second exposure on sand. Something to think about, your camera will sink into the ground as you're, edit as you're uh, taking that shot. So there's a slight bit of movement here, but not enough uh, for me to really worry about it too much because it's so far off in the back of my image there. So I need to get rid of this chromatic aberration. I'm going to go to lens corrections, go to color and go to remove chromatic aberrations and just kind of bring this purple amount up and bring this green amount up. And sometimes you'll see that the hue might need to change. If maybe the hue of that purple is somewhere over in this direction, you just find where that hue is and what color it is and move your purple hue amount over to where that is to match it up completely. And I think I've got it pretty well here. The next thing I'm going to be battling with though is going to be noise. So let me go over here to my uh, sharpening and detail section. So really what I do with noise is very much the same on many of my images. I will just go ahead and increase this luminance amount up to about 25 or 26. And then I don't want to go too far. I don't want it to turn into a milky pasty image. Okay. But look at this one down here, the color uh, adjustment here, this color slider. I want to bring that color slider up so that the color detail gets fixed in those little areas. So if I had this, here's the before, and then here's the after. If you look, well, let's look at the after in a second. Right here, we've got some color noise. If we look at the after, that color noise has more of a, of a less saturated amount of color in that noise area. So I don't get like these blues and purples that are mixing up in my noise that should be more of a neutral color. So let's go back to where we were in the beginning. We'll go ahead and fit on screen. So we'll make this all fit right in our view here. So this is looking pretty good. Uh, let's see our before, total before, total after. Looking good, but we can take this further and we can take it further with other adjustments. So you see here, we've used quite a bit of our regular adjustments here in our, in our uh, basic adjustment panel. So we can't really take these too much farther because if we do, we're going to take them over the edge. Now we need to do things a little bit more selectively. So the first thing that I'm going to do is the graduated filter. Okay, I'm going to do two of these, one graduated filter for the sky and one graduated filter for the foreground. So my graduated filter for the sky in what you're seeing right now and for areas to come, these are artistic expressions. What you're going to see here is I'm going to be modifying color along with tone. That's going to bring out a more artistic representation of the scene. So you have the ability to, to use this to your leisure to make the scene kind of come out to the colors that you want to see. 
Now, I do remember being on this scene and there was this nice kind of uh, amberish and purplish glow to it that you're just not seeing here because sometimes those neutral density filters can leave a slight blue cast. The VU filter is actually very good and only leave a very small amount of blue cast. So because of that blue color, I'm going to make a uh, neutral density fix, essentially. It's basically going to be a color correction that's being added to both the top and bottom of my photo independently because they have different settings that need to happen for the tones and colors that are within the background and the foreground. You have to work on them separately. After I work on them separately, I'm going to come back in and split tone them to even get this more artistic look. So let's go ahead and I know for a fact that I'm going to make this warmer. So I'm just going to click the plus sign on just this warmth because I don't want the last settings that were here last. So just click the plus or minus and that will reset the whole graduated filter to something that you can work with. So I'm just going to grab right here and just kind of pull down and press and hold shift as I do it. That'll help it remain straight. And I'm going to go just before the edge of my background here in, in, in the horizon line to just below it. Okay. So I increased that temperature quite a bit. Now I want to make it a little bit more of that purplish, get that more amberish glow in there. So I'm going to bring that up to about point, well, about 59 or 60. That looks good about there. Again, these settings in particular are going to be uh, very strict based on the setting that you're in. So these temperature settings might not be perfect for your image. Okay, keep that in mind because the dynamic range is going to change, the color is going to change, the scenes are going to change, yada, 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 so forth. I also want to bring down the exposure quite a bit here. So I'm going to bring that down to about, uh, let's say about 0.6 and maybe I'll adjust it from the time being and then bring up my contrast a little bit. And then again, look at those highlights, maybe increase those highlights a little bit to get that nice glow back here to resurrect some of that glow, bring that up. And I'm also going to bring my shadows up quite a bit here and then maybe bring my whites down to get that color a little more accurate back there. So this looks pretty good. The only thing I want to do now is go into the brush settings here. Now with the brush, I can actually brush away things that I don't want to be edited. So right here, you got the plus and the minus. I'm going to click the minus sign and I'm going to click down here at my mask so that I can see exactly what's being edited here. And with that mask, let's go ahead and drop the opacity of this mask a little bit so we can see some of the underlying stuff underneath it. Okay, and I'm going to brush away anything that I don't want to be modified by this graduated adjustment. Okay, so just grab right here. I've got auto mask selected. So it's doing a pretty good job of staying in the constraints of exactly what I want it to, to edit. So I don't want this stuff here. And that auto mask is right here. If you click auto mask, it'll stay within the pixel range of something that's big and blocky, essentially. Once these pixels start to match the pixels around it and the rest of the image, then the auto mask doesn't work quite as well. But because we have such a separation between foreground and background with these very distinct shapes, it's very easy for Photoshop to pick that out. And I'll remove that mask option there so that we can see exactly what happened. So with this new graduated filter that I'm going to add here, I want to make sure that all of the settings zero out. So I'm not using the same settings from this graduated filter. So I'll just go ahead and press the plus sign on that, you know, 0 0.50. Just give me a little boost in exposure real quick and grab right about here and boost this up to about here, pressing and holding shift so that it stays straight and only moves within, uh, I think it's 15, 15 degree angles at a time. Okay. And then now what I want to do is just start adjusting this a little bit, bring the foreground forward a little bit more so that the viewer in, gets engulfed in the, in the opening of the image. Cause that's what, where they're going to be looking at first. That's where I want them to be looking at first. So I get to control what they look at first. So to do that, I'm going to brighten up all the stuff in the foreground quite a bit. So I brought up the exposure. I'm going to bring it up just a little bit more to about 0.6. And I'm going to go to my highlights and bring my highlights up a little bit more. And then I'm going to go to my shadows and even open up those shadows a little bit more. And you're wondering why I'm doing this. Well, the reason why I'm opening up this area so much and giving this area so much brightness is because the first area I want the viewer to look at is this area, the foreground area. And to do that, we can do multiple things. We can increase the saturation of that area, but the most prominent one is to make your highlights be the area that you want the viewer to see first. Now, a very powerful tool. Make an area brighter if you want that to be seen first. Our eye is naturally going to go to brighter areas in the photo first before it ventures out to the rest of the photo. So I'm controlling the viewer at this point. It's all about manipulation of the viewer. And now I'm going to bring that contrast up. And the reason why I'm bringing the contrast up is as I brought all this up, I'm losing all of the depth in between the little pieces of the rocks. So if I increase the contrast, it's going to help boost those black to white areas.
Now we can go a little bit further here. We could go into the whites and darks here, but I think the whites and darks are pretty good. And let's go to our before. This is before we even started doing anything with our graduated adjustments. And now look at it after the graduated adjustments and we're almost done. Okay. The last thing I want to apply to this is some more color correction. And what I'm going to do with that is something called split toning and split toning is really interesting because um, you can actually add more color to highlights and more color to shadows independently. So where you find this in Adobe camera Raw is right here. It says split toning. So, if you increase the hue to get a hue for the highlight colors, nothing's going to happen. You have to increase that saturation. So this is basically saying all of the highlight areas will start to get a gold tone, a green tone, a cyan tone, a blue tone, or a magenta tone. It's basically all we're doing. So I want to bring this up. So all my highlight areas get a really nice magenta tone to them. And I brought the saturation all the way up so I could see the exact color that I'm applying to my highlights. And now I will bring the saturation down to something I'm more comfortable with, like the 25 range. So you see that before, and now we're giving all of our highlights a slight added color to them. We can do the same thing for our shadows. So if we bring this, this is basically saying all of our shadow areas are now going to be red, our orange, our yellow, our green, cyan, blue, and more magenta. Now I want all of it to have the pretty much the same uh, color range. So if I'm working with a magenta in my highlights, I want my shadows to be somewhere in the range of magenta uh, that that's really close on the color wheel so that there's harmony in the photo. So I'm going to take that to about, uh, let's say about 260, give that a bluish type of tinge to my shadows to match the overall uh, pinkish tinge that I gave to this, to the highlights. And then again, bring down that saturation quite a bit. And then if we go into the balance, this is where you can say, okay, I want most of that to go towards the highlights or most of it to go towards my shadows. I think the balance is pretty good where it is right about here. So let's go to our overall before. Here's the overall before, before we did anything. And here's the after. Press P for the preview. We did quite a bit, but we could still do a little bit more. I think this needs a little bit, just a little boost of maybe some vibrance to get some more color in there. Maybe even just a slight boost of overall saturation. Uh, maybe not overall saturation because of what it's doing back here. Let's bring that saturation down a little bit and then just boost that vibrance a little bit. The difference between vibrance and saturation is vibrance. I kind of think is more of like a smart saturation because it looks at the areas in your image that need a little bit more saturation and just uh, gives them a slight bit more of saturation than uh, some of the other areas. Another way to look at it, um, not the smart way is that this will, protect your skin tone colors as you boost the vibrance. So if you're doing a portrait and you boost the vibrance a little bit, maybe the color of their clothes, if it's got a nice vibrant blue and yellow in it will boost, but their, their skin tones will remain relatively the same. Let's take one last look at all this stuff that we did here. Here is the overall before. This is before most of our adjustments. It does have the straightening in there, but that's about it. And here's the after nice glowing resurrected image. Now, this, like I said before, it's probably about four stops underexposed in the foreground and about two stops overexposed in the sky. Now, the beauty of working with a raw file is that there is that much information in there. So if you're not shooting in raw, get in raw now, because I could not have resurrected this photo with a JPEG. A JPEG is a snapshot at best. Okay. A raw file, you have a lot of, uh, leeway to work with here. And you know, some people have this mindset that, oh, we do so much with our digital images that it's not the true nature of photography. And I call that completely BS. And the reason why is because a JPEG is basically a, uh, contact sheet. So if you have a whole series of JPEGs, that's a contact sheet. It'd be like me saying, Hey, here's my best photo. It's the, on the contact sheet. A raw file is the actual negative. This is what allows you to get into the digital dark room and create an, just a phenomenal photograph with all of that information that's held in that raw file. It's the same thing that you would see in something like a negative in the film world. So yeah, we do some cheating here if you want to call it that. And there might be some integrity issues in what we're doing with the digital. I put quotations around that because I think it's ridiculous. Um, there might be some integrity issues that some people have with what we're doing with digital images, but really it comes down to the art form. It comes down to what we see, what we wanted to see and what we want the viewer to see. All right. That's what art is. And photography is a form of art. So 
Again, my name is Blake Rudis, and this is how you make an underexposed photograph look badass uh, relatively quickly. And I, when I first set out to record this video, just so you know, I tried to do this in under three minutes and I'm going on 20. So I just can't make something three minutes on something that I feel this strongly about. All right. So uh, if you like this, comment on it share it, tell a friend. Um, if you know someone who shoots in JPEG, be like, hey dude, check this tutorial out or do that. This tutorial will show you the reasons why you should be shooting in RAW and not the archaic JPEG. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this. I sincerely appreciate it.